Today I'll be sharing the absolutely insane story of a civil rights leader that wasn't all that they seemed. Born on November 12th, 1977, Rachel Dolezal grew up in a small county bordering the north of Montana. Due to her deeply religious parents, she was homeschooled through a Christian program. The young girl excelled, maintaining a 4.0 GPA and even graduating as valid Victorian. Naturally, after high school, Rachel decided to pursue a post-secondary education, but the honor student wasn't prepared to learn just how different life was in the outside world. You see, Dolezal's upbringing had shielded her from racism, never having to experience the prejudices others faced every day. Because of this, it came as a sort of culture shock. In 2000, Rachel was admitted to the historically black Howard University. Much to her dismay, the issue was pervasive even there, leading her to sue the campus for discrimination. It became her moral imperative to stand up against inequality, a value she would carry for the rest of her life. While attending, Rachel fell in love with another student named Kevin Moore. The relationship took off with a running start, and before she even had graduated, the two married and even conceived a child together. In 2002, the expecting mother received her master's in fine arts. For her thesis project, she created a series of paintings presented from the perspective of a black man. Having acquired the field's terminal degree and now starting a family life appeared picture perfect for the newlyweds, but this status quo ended as quickly as it began. Only two years later, the couple formally separated. According to legal documents, the relationship fell apart due to trust issues. Kevin alleged she turned their son against him. Dolezal claimed that Moore had abused them. Regardless of whoever was telling the truth, Rachel recalled feeling liberated once it was settled. After all, she was now free to pursue her dream of becoming an activist. From protesting to politically charged artwork, she became an admirable figure in the community. Just a few months after the divorce was finalized, Rachel made headlines for the first time. To help fundraise money, the artist designed a fountain titled The Triumph of Human Spirit. It depicted sad figures carrying the weight of those on top. She also began working as a part-time instructor at two local colleges. Initially only hired to teach art, the young woman's advocacy showed her full capabilities. Rachel was eventually assigned to lead East Washington University's program about Africana education. This included courses discussing African American culture and the black woman's struggle. In 2008, Rachel joined the Human Rights Institute, where she served for two years before resigning. In 2012, Rachel was elected president of the local NAACP chapter. She was later credited as revitalizing the organization. Now with a strong track record in social justice, her reputation as a prominent minority voice had solidified. While most celebrated, this notoriety wasn't seen positively by everyone. In speaking out against prejudice, she became a prime target for racially motivated attacks. On September 29th, 2009, it was reported that a noose had been left on her porch. This occurred five days after her home was broken into, in which many belongings were stolen. Though the perpetrator was never caught, the invoking of lynching implied it wasn't a random burglary, but a targeted attack. And this is far from the only example. In total, Rachel recalled being a victim to eight separate hate crimes. This included a series of derogatory letters as well as vandalism. It's safe to say that most under this pressure would retreat from the public eye, but not Rachel. Despite her safety at constant risk, the activist persisted. Not only that, but she went further, applying for a position in the Police Ombudsman Commission. This allowed her to become the voice of the local community's concerns. In May of 2014, Rachel was appointed chairwoman of the organization by the mayor himself. Now working with both law enforcement and the local NAACP, she'd become extremely influential. Yet even that could not end the harassment. In February of 2015, Rachel discovered a package at her mailbox in the NAACP. 
it was filled with pictures of lynchings, as well as references to famous hate crimes. There was no return address, with the writer only referring to themselves as the war pick. Immediately, Dolezal alerted authorities before writing about the incident over Facebook. She understandably became paranoid, ruminating over where the letter could have come from. At one point, Rachel claimed to have seen two individuals prowling her property. She claimed they broke into her home and scared her 13-year-old son to death. Interestingly enough, though, her own son disagreed with this assessment, surmising they were simply a lost couple who'd misread the address. They look confused to me. They look like normal middle-class white people. They never threaten me. Given Rachel's local significance, law enforcement wasted no time investigating. But there was one immediate discrepancy they couldn't ignore. The envelope had neither a stamp or barcode. This indicated it had never gone through the postal system and must have been placed there by hand. This narrowed the pool of suspects substantially, and eventually officers were able to rule out every individual, eliminating all except one. You see, investigators realized many of the images were taken from Dolezal's various presentations about racism. They also found no fingerprints on the package apart from hers. While not conclusive, they slowly began to recognize a pattern. Meanwhile, the woman became erratic. In May, she received another letter from the so-called war pick. But rather than spout vitriol, it was bizarrely an apology. The author expressed remorse over the ordeal, professing regret to both Rachel and the public. If this was an attempt to further distract law enforcement, it didn't work. Because on June 10th, they officially suspended their investigation. In an 11-page report of their findings, authorities surmised no direct threats against the activist. The obvious implication was she had written them herself. It sparked a wave of outrage and confusion amongst the community. Her supporters began to question the activist's integrity, unsure if any of the hate crimes she reported were genuine. One thing was for certain though, no matter the outcome, Rachel Dolezal wasn't all she seemed. Because within 24 hours, her darkest secret would be revealed, when it was discovered that for two decades, the activist had lied about being black. We'll learn more about this after a brief word from our sponsor. While there are many downsides to getting older, thankfully one of them doesn't have to be hair loss with modern medicine, and that is where today's sponsor, Keeps, comes into the picture. The great thing is there are clinically proven treatments out there that will help with this problem. And with Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right treatment plan for you. Then the products will be shipped directly to your door every three months. And if there's ever a problem, your Keeps doctor is available 24 seven to answer questions. I really do respect this company for coming out here and informing men that there is something they can do about their hair loss. Just remember that prevention is key, and the faster you get on these FDA-approved medications, the more hair you can save. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com gfm, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's keeps.com gfm. Given that filing a false report in the state of Washington is a misdemeanor, Rachel seemingly got off easy with the police not pursuing a case against her. But unfortunately for the mother, it would set off a chain reaction culminating in questions about her race. It was a warm summer day in June of 2015 when a reporter from ABC began to dig through the activist's past. On Facebook, he found an image of Rachel standing next to a black man she claimed was her father. A quick background check quickly proved this to be a lie. The next day, he convinced Rachel to film an on-camera interview about the letters. But after eight minutes, he changed the subject to confront her about the true color of her skin. This man right here is your father? Right there? Do you have a question about that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was wondering if, uh, <laughs> if your dad really is an African-American man. That's a very... I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're implying. Are you African American? I don't, I don't understand 
the question. Realizing she'd been exposed, Rachel turned off the mic and stormed away, abruptly ending the interview. But it was too late. As soon as the clip aired, the story became a viral sensation. How couldn't it? It was shocking to learn that a black civil rights leader had been white all along. The disgraced activist then began trending as onlookers on the internet began to mock her relentlessly. In response to the media storm, she made her first attempt to defend herself, arguing that the question was not as easy as it seemed because we're all from the African continent. This was in vain, as things would quickly get a lot worse. Because on the next day, her biological Logical parents began to speak out about her actual background. Still living at their home in northwest Montana, Larry and Ruth Dolezal revealed they had lost contact with Rachel years ago. The couple was unable to explain their daughter's disguise, never having been told the reason themselves. They speculated it may have begun after the family adopted four African-American children while she was a teenager. To erase any doubts of their identity, Larry provided both Rachel's birth certificate and childhood photos. These revealed her to be undeniably white. Her father was then quoted as stating, She is so assimilated into their culture and their community that she she may falsely consider herself African American, but by birth she certainly is not. In response to her family, Rachel replied, I don't give two shits what you guys think. You're so far done and out of my life. The daughter then made the bizarre point that she had never taken a DNA test. If you recall, Rachel began working for human rights organizations years prior to this bombshell. What the public didn't know was that suspicions had arisen in these organizations even back then. One board member recalled Rachel discovering a swastika drawn on the entrance of a building. Somehow, the security camera had been mysteriously turned off. Dolezal left the Human Rights Education Institute in 2010 on bad terms. In articles regarding her departure, she claimed to have been pressured to forcibly resign. It's unknown what exactly occurred, though a co-worker claimed to have hired a private investigator to verify her claims. With this, both the NAACP and law enforcement launched internal investigations into Dolezal. The former would defend her, issuing a press statement that noted one's racial identity was not a qualifier for their leadership. The latter was much less charitable. They concluded she had engaged in a pattern of misconduct, ranging from lying about her race to workplace harassment. The tabloid sensation eventually left both, stepping down as leader and being removed in a unanimous vote. She also was dismissed from her position as an instructor. These developments showed that clues to her obfuscation were always there. But they did little to answer the biggest question underlying it all. Namely, why on earth she lied about being black in the first place? Well, to this point, upon graduating high school, Rachel enrolled into Belhaven University. It was there that she became a part of their racial reconciliation community, her introduction to social justice. After receiving a bachelor's, she then applied to the predominantly black Howard U. Her application is said to have consisted of African-American portraiture, which led the school to mistake her for a black woman. It was briefly noted before that in 2002, Rachel sued the school for supposed discrimination. Unlike the activist's later claims, however, back then she alleged that her persecution was for being white. The lawsuit claims that the student had been denied teaching positions and scholarships on the basis of her skin. But the judge, and subsequently an appeals court, found it had no basis in reality. It's interesting to reconcile this against her later actions. The suit implies she felt exiled by both staff members and peers. Because of this, could it have influenced her decision to transition? It's possible, but doesn't make entire sense given the disguise began long after she graduated. The same year this case was thrown out, Rachel and her husband divorced. Despite Kevin being being actually African-American, she later claimed to have been quote-unquote too black for him. He apparently discouraged her from tanning and wearing black hairstyles. Rachel reflected, Kevin's blackness wasn't the cause of our disconnect. If anything, it was his disdain for blackness that created so much distance between us. And sure enough, within years, she was no longer checking white on medical forms. By 2009, Dolezal began describing herself as transracial 
and three years after that, her true ethnicity was hidden entirely, as she begged siblings not to blow her cover. If we're to believe this narrative, she had always felt black on the inside, but wasn't able to express it until her late 20s. In 2017, Rachel released a memoir titled In Full Color, Finding My Place in a Black and White World. There she recalled experiencing those feelings in childhood. She wrote, I would pretend to be a dark-skinned princess in the Sahara Desert, or one of the Bantu women living in the Congo, imagining I was a different person living in a different place was one of the few ways that I could escape the oppressive environment I was raised in. She then went on to describe rubbing mud on her hands, arms, and legs to imitate being African. Truthfully, we may never fully understand her reasoning. Even after being made a national laughingstock, Rachel not only defended herself but doubled down. Her belief is that there's no distinction between supporting black causes and identifying as black, stating in an interview, I really just prefer to be exactly who I am, and black is really the closest race and cultural category that represents the essence of who I am. In the aforementioned autobiography, she also recounts a troubling amount of childhood abuse. While it's difficult to take her word at face value, it does appear that her family was dysfunctional. In 2010, Rachel obtained a legal guardianship over one of her adopted brothers. This occurred after the one sibling alleged their parents severely beat them and threatened to move them to a group home. Her biological brother was also accused of assaulting one of the adopted children, though these charges were dismissed. Ultimately, if anything can be cited as an explanation, something traumatic appears to have happened in her childhood, and so it's quite possible that this race transition was simply a coping mechanism taken too far. In the years since she was outed, Rachel gave birth to her third son, Langston Atticus, named after two African-American historical figures. Her memoir went on to become a mild success, earning over $84,000 in revenue. The problem was, in order to continue receiving food stamps, she intentionally didn't report this revenue, claiming to have only an income of $500. This led her to be arrested for welfare fraud. In 2019, the ex activist agreed to a plea deal in which she would pay the money back alongside 120 hours of community service. In spite of a name change and rather sympathetic Netflix documentary, to this day people detest Rachel for her decades of deception. And because of this, she struggles to remain employed, most recently starting in OnlyFans to make ends meet. To this very day, it's unknown if there's any validity to the supposed hate crimes against Rachel which caused this story to break out in the first place, and we will probably never get answers to those questions. So with that, I think I'll end the video here, and until next time, thanks for watching.